Okay, we're gonna go ahead and get started. Welcome everybody, thank you so much for joining us here today. I am Maureen Ryan, I'm the Deputy Director of the Center for 21st Century Studies at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee. And this is the most recent installment of our Long 2020 series. Okay, um, we're gonna go ahead oh, and get no, somebody... started. Welcome everybody, thank you so much. Okay, that was me, I'm turning it off. I just set myself up so that wouldn't happen, but apparently I didn't do it right. And it's always distracting to hear your own voice. Okay. Um, for those of you joining us in the Zoom, I just wanted to let you know, we're also live streaming on YouTube. So there's a couple of just logistical things I wanna say at the beginning, and then I will introduce our speakers today, um, Roderick Ferguson and Rebecca Wanzo. So the Zoom functionality is the webinar functionality, your video and audio are off. If you'd like to leave a question or a comment, feel free to do so at any time. You don't have to wait until we get to that portion of the event. And please use the Q&A button. I know there are raise hands and chat, but the Q&A is where I'll be looking to collect questions from when we get to that point of the event. Um, so please do that. If you are watching on YouTube, feel free to throw a comment in the YouTube chat and we will be monitoring that as well. And we'll kind of bring it into our conversation here. Uh, we'll aim to go about 90 minutes um, less if everybody is feeling satisfied. Um, and I will say a little bit about our Long 2020 series and then I'll introduce our panelists. So the Long 2020 is our spring speaker series at the Center for 21st Century Studies. It's also going to be published as a book, an edited collection with Minnesota Press. And the goal of this uh, project has been to think through um, the manifold crises um, that kind of became visible in 2020, not only the COVID-19 pandemic, but widespread, widespread protests for racial justice, um, the violent suppression to these protests, um, the political crises, uh, you know, surrounding Donald Trump's presidency and the kind of assault on the democratic norms and institutions that had kind of carried our nation through its history. Um, also climate crises, the record-breaking fires and hurricanes across the globe. Um, 2020 seemed to be this huge rupture. And yet if we were to think carefully and many scholars are, are doing this work, you know, those crises have very deep roots and they also will cast a long shadow into the future. So with this project, we sought to think through um, in an inter interdisciplinary way, um, what has precipitated these events, why they appear to be crises, um, and what sorts of, how we can think through them in the moment so that we are better prepared to understand our future. Um, so that's really the idea behind this. And so this particular talk, um, we're really thrilled to be joined by Roderick Ferguson of um, Yale and Rebecca Lonzo of Washington University in St. Louis. Um, their conversation, if I, <laughs> Um, have their brief descriptions correct. Are, they're going to center on ideas about post-truth um, and the kind of history, the US political landscape as it pertains to um, issues of race, gender, and sexuality. So I'm gonna give a brief bio for each of them and then I'm gonna turn it over to Rod to give his brief about 15 minute talk and then Rebecca will give hers and then we will have a discussion. So Roderick Ferguson is Professor of Women's Gender and Sexuality Studies at Yale University, an interdisciplinary scholar. His work traverses American studies, gender studies, queer studies, cultural studies, African-American studies, sociology, literature, and education. He is the author of One Dimensional Queer, We Demand, The University and Student Protests, The Reorder of Things, The University and Its Pedagogies of Minority Difference, and Aberrations in Black Toward a Queer of Color Critique. Rebecca Wanzo is professor and chair of the Department of Women, Gender and Sexuality Studies at Washington U University in St. Louis. Her research interests include African-American literature and culture, critical race theory, fan studies, feminist theory, the history of popular fiction in the US, cultural studies, theories of affect and graphic storytelling. Her recent books include the content of our caricature, African-American comic art and political belonging, and the suffering will not be televised, African-American women and sentimental political storytelling. Thank you so much to each of you. I'm really excited for this conversation. Um, and I will turn it over to Rod to begin. All right, well, thanks to Maureen and Richard for this invitation. Um, what I'm gonna present is actually a keynote that I gave in 2018 
on the discourse of the post-truth. And at the time, this is before the pandemic, before everything that happened in 2020, and the post-truth was um, expressed in those moments as a kind of resistance to factual evidence, um, whether it had to do with uh, whether or not uh, Barack Obama was an American citizen or um, you know, the controversies around uh, Hillary Clinton. Um, since then, you know, we could add to the sort of catalog of the post-truth, whether or not the coronavirus is a novel virus or is it simply the flu, um, whether or not Donald Trump actually lost the election, whether or not uh, the state of Georgia uh, went blue. And so even though I started with, you know, a particular eye on certain expressions of the post-truth, uh, the talk also pertains to the later uh, post-truth discourses. And um, why don't I just start? Okay. Most of the commentary on the post-truth moment consigns it to the presidential campaign of Donald Trump and his eventual appointment as president by the Electoral College. In doing so, the post-truth moment is understood to emanate from the idiosyncrasies of a particular individual figure. As the moment in which the authority of facts is degraded, the post-truth is hence framed as something that can be explained through the discrete occurrences of a particular campaign and a particular presidency. Other accounts of the post-truth horizon engage it as a breakdown of norms of accountability concerning evidence and rational argumentation. This post-truth ethos cannot be explained simply through Trump. Indeed, it pre precedes him. It also cannot be explained as an idiosyncratic occurrence. In fact, it is part of a deliberate and well-planned historical formation. It is a historical formation that is also not deracinated from social ideologies of race class, gender, and sexuality, but firmly rooted in them. The ideological origins of the post-truth moment are evident, especially in its development in the 1980s onward. In that moment, the ideological connotations of the post-truth discourse were most evident during the Reagan and Bush years. In fact, the current post-truth moment inherits these earlier iterations from the 1980s. Those earlier moments were, were responding to the various critiques of forms of power coming from art, activism, and scholarship. One way of thinking about the origins of the post-truth is to read them as efforts to resist the critical and affective inroads attempted by anti-racist, feminist, anti-capitalist, and queer formations. This talk, therefore, investigates the post-truth ethos in the US as a backlash not simply to the status typically enjoyed by the factual and the empirical, but to the affective inroads made by anti-racist, queer, and feminist intellectual production. As such, the post-truth moment does not only represent the demotion of empirical knowledge, but the unseating of historical and cultural knowledge about racial, gender, and sexual minorities and its potential to disrupt the coherence of subjects privileged by race, gender, and sexuality, and the innocence of the US nation state. The category post-truth was first used in a 1992 article written by the late Serbian American writer, Steve Tesich. In his article, The Watergate Scandal, A Government of Lies, Tesich drew attention to the deliberate subterfuge and misleading of the American public during the Reagan Bush years. After truth prevailed because of pressures from social protests, media and legislation, responding to Vietnam and Watergate, Tesich identifies a shift as he stated, quote, but in the wake of that triumph, something totally unforeseen occurred either because the Watergate revelations were so wrenching and followed on the heels of the war in Vietnam, which was replete with crimes and revelations of its own, or because Nixon was so quickly pardoned, we began to shy away from the truth." End quote. Those moments occasion not only a shift away from truth, 
but U.S. society's capacity to stomach the truth as well. As Tessich argued, quote, we came to equate the truth with bad news and we didn't want bad news anymore, no matter how true or vital to our health as a nation. We look to our government to protect us from the truth, end quote. The social turn away from truth, Tessich went on to argue, provided a kind of cover for the Iran-Contra scandal, which he described as, quote, far more serious and un-American than the crimes for which Nixon was kicked out of office, end quote. As he said, these latest crimes attack the very heart and soul of our republic, a private little government was created to pursue a private foreign policy agenda and thereby circumvent the law of the land, the Congress, the constitution itself." End quote. Known as the Iran-Contra affair, senior administrative officials within the US government sold arms to Iran in hopes that those arms would then be sold to the right wing rebel group in Nicaragua known as the Contras. Iran was the subject of an arms embargo at the time, and the Boland Act Amendment of 1982 had prohibited the further sale of US arms to the Contras. Relating this branch, this breach within American government to authoritarian regimes, Tessich went on to say, quote, the hidden layer of government which diminishes democratic institutions to a series of front organizations is a well-known feature of totalitarian regimes. There is a government line presented to the public and a party line that functions in the back rooms. As he stated, quote, the line in this case was the Republican party line, but it was no different in its implementation and its implications from the communist party line to the pre-Gorbachev Soviet Union, end quote. As Vietnam and Watergate provided openings for Iran-Contra, they all produced the conditions for the deceptions of the Gulf War, according to Tessich. Discussing the Gulf War, he pointed to the State Department's own declassification of the diplomatic cables of US Ambassador April Glaspie, who, contrary to the cables, told the Senate that Saddam Hussein was warned not to violate the territorial integrity of Kuwait. Commenting on this, Tessich argued, quote, it now turns out that it was all a lie, but the fact that the Bush administration felt safe in declassifying those cables shows it was no longer afraid of the truth because it knows the truth will have little impact on us, end quote. Tessich asserted that the post-truth produced a devastating intellectual and moral crisis one that can be seen in the state's rejection of critical education and the people's acceptance of that rejection. Quote, we keep asking why the level of our children's intelligence and competence as measured by all the tests keeps dropping. The reason is very simple. We don't want them to be well-educated. The last thing we want now is for an intellectually and spiritually vigorous generation to confront us with the question of what we have done to this country, end quote. The post-truth was part of an elaborate system that educates and convinces people away from truth as an instrument of critical engagement between the people and apparatuses of power. This system for Tessage was what causes a democracy to teeter toward totalitarianism. Quote, all the dictators up to now have had to work hard at suppressing the truth. We, by our actions, are saying that this is no longer necessary, that we have acquired a spiritual mechanism that can denude truth of any significance. In a very fundamental way, we as a free people have freely decided that we want to live in a post-truth world, end quote. Hence, the post-truth is not the diagnosis of a benighted head of state. It is the diagnosis of a social formation in which the state and its people are implicated. The cultural turn away from the authority of truth was part of a hegemonic struggle between elite efforts to subjugate knowledge 
and critical efforts to disinter that knowledge. Indeed, the moments that Tessich used to periodize the post-truth, the Vietnam War, the Watergate scandal, the, Ira the Iran-Contra affair, and the Gulf War were also periods characterized by vigorous responses in terms of social movements, art, and criticism. The artists, activists, and scholars who produced those responses would ask the nation and its people to confront the truth in all its historical and social unpleasantness, an unpleasantness that has racial, gender, sexual, and class contours. This would involve not only an intellectual encounter with the truth of state and social violence, it would also entail an affective and psychic confrontation with ongoing histories of violence as well. Those critiques had an explicitly affective and psychic agenda, one designed to tear down the American self's strategies of resistance where critiques of authority were concerned. These critiques and their related affective and psychic agendas were prominently seen in intersectional engagements with race, gender, class, and sexuality, engagements designed to tear down a national armory of ideological and psychic resistances designed to bolster state nationalism and systemic exploitations within and outside the US. Put plainly, the 1980s represented a moment in which the post-truth and critiques of it reveal themselves to have simultaneously ideological and psychic agendas. There is a long list of work coming out of the 1970s and 80s that attempted to address the importance of a psychic confrontation with and working through of racial, gender, class, and sexual exploitation that characterize both the US nation state and Western civilization. Think for instance of Toni Morrison's 1970 novel, The Bluest Eye, about a little black girl who longs for the one thing that would make her life complete, a blue eye. Morrison used the novel to address the psychic life of racism and the ways in which that life was promoted by media and by standards of beauty. Consider as well the Kumbahi River Collective's linking of psychological dispossession with structural exclusions in their 1977, A Black Feminist Statement, addressing the dual structural and psychic assault of racial, gender, and sexual power. They wrote, quote, we are dispossessed psychologically and on every other level, and yet we feel the necessity to struggle to change the condition of all Black women, end quote. In Poetry is Not a Luxury, first written for the journal Chrysalis in 1977, Audre Lorde said this about the psychic agendas of gender and sexual domination as it per pertains to women, quote, for within the living structures defined by profit, by linear power, by institutional dehumanization, our feelings were not meant to survive, kept around as unavoidable adjuncts of pleasant pastimes. Feelings were expected to kneel to thought as women were expected to kneel to men, In quote. Reading power as partly the distortion and domination of the affective and understanding dreams to be the landscapes where freedom might be imagined Lord went on to write, those dreams are made realizable through our poems that give us the strength and courage to see, to feel, to speak, and to dare, end quote. In another context, Lord continued her interest in the psychic life of power and freedom. For instance, in February 1982, she delivered a lecture for Malcolm X Weekend at Harvard University. In that lecture entitled, Learning from the 60s, Lord addressed the political and affective dimensions of black radical struggles, writing, quote, one of the most basic survival skills is the ability to change, to metabolize experience, good or ill, into something that is useful, lasting, effective. 400 years of survival as an endangered species has taught most of us that if we intend to live, we had better become fast learners. Malcolm knew this, end quote. 
we might think of Lord's use of the metabolic metaphor as a model for confronting historical exigencies and traumas. As such, the metabolic metaphor implies processes by which those traumas and exigencies are synthesized and broken down in order to produce new forms of social and subjective mobilizations. In this instance, historical violence is mobilized as the antithesis of the post-truth evasion of historical confrontation. As a metabolic gesture, to confront history is to synthesize and break down the contradictions, traumas, and violences of nation states. Discussing the developing role of US empire in Latin America in the early 80s, soon after the Iran-Contra affair was developing, but before its exposure, Lord wrote, quote, we are functioning under a government ready to repeat in El Salvador and Nicaragua the tragedy of Vietnam, a government which stands on the wrong side of every single battle for liberation taking place upon the globe, end quote. Here, Lord was using her speech to underline the necessity of producing oneself as a subject who can point toward the ugliness that is concealed by the state. Like many other writers and artists during the period, Lord would help to establish the confrontation with the unpleasant truths of history as the horizon of intellectual production and psychic possibility. The 1970s and 80s represent moments in which dominant forces attempted to erect psychic armories against the critique of the state and forms of inequality. In addition, they were moments in which counter hegemonic forces attempted to produce critiques of the state and the inequalities that it generated and encouraged. In addition, those decades signify periods in which those counter hegemonic forces worked to produce psychic and subjective dispositions that could hold those critiques in awareness. In doing so, they were struggling against a developing post-truth milieu that insisted on the right of American citizens, in particular, to be unencumbered by the other and the historical exigencies that surround the other. Thank you. Thanks very much. Rebecca, the floor is yours. Well, I'm grateful for the invitation. It's honor, um, an honor to present next to Rod here. Um, the work I'm presenting builds on some thinking that I've been doing over a number of years about um, temporality um, and the idea of progress and progress narratives. So Google Trends tells us that the idea of the worst year began appearing regularly in 2010 in Google searches. News sources had previously reported when corporations had their worst years ever. Of course, tragedy struck individuals uh, were discussed as having had the worst years of their lives. Uh, and there were undoubtedly moments that people identified as cursed, unparalleled and devastating. Many more lives have been lost in various years, but it took social media storytelling to create the conditions under which people would construct a collective narrative of years as nadirs. In 2016, New Yorker staff writer Gia Talentina was one of a number of commentators who began condemning the tendency toward the worst year designation. 2016 began with people declaring that the deaths of Prince and David Bowie marked the year as the worst and ended with Donald Trump's election. The months in between were filled by the perennial celebrity deaths, mass shootings, and natural disasters. The atemporality of the events that are nonetheless marked as the worst make the hyperbole of the affective condemnation of an arbitrary time interval transparent. 
Now to be clear, I experienced Prince's death as a tragedy and collectively mourned with other fans. Um, but the unnuanced excesses of the internet highlight its struggle with proportionality and scale. Then came 2020, which was undoubtedly a substantive rupture for many people whose lives had not been precarious before. But there are 80 million refugees and displaced people around the world. Poverty and violence are perpetual threats. However, scholars who explore the question of the worst year through data sets and archeological evidence argue that various presents, the 21st century, the 20th century, or any period that is not prehistoric is demonstrably less violent. Steven Pinker's The Better Angels of Our Nature is the most prominent version of this argument, but other scholars, such as a group of mathematicians who looked at the history of battle deaths in an essay published just last year, 2020, also argue that this time is not the worst. In contrast, scholars like philosopher John Gray question the utility of data sets in what's called the long piece thesis. He argues that the idea that the enlightenment produces less cruelty willfully ignores how it was the foundation for scientific racism, colonialism, genocide, and other illiberal supports of violence. Battlefield deaths in the counterargument are a poor proxy for measuring process of progress when the nuclear threat of mass destruction has served as a deterrent and thus encouraged instead necropolitics and slow violence. For Gray, this is big, big data as divination, another misguided attempt to use science to bolster faith in the future. Methodological skirmishes over the history of violence are but one example in the long struggle over the competing stories told in the West about progress and time. Managing the relationship between fact and fiction and questions of progress is complicated, not only by the questions we ask, but by where we are and have historically been located, even in the same space. A moment in Samuel Delaney's Dahlgren that speaks to notion of how time and space are related to each other and that the competing notions govern our understanding of it is instructive in this sense. A character states, I live in one city, maybe you live in another. In mine, time leaks, sloshes backwards and forwards, turns up and shows what's on its underside. Things shift. Yeah, maybe you could explain. In your city, you're sane and I'm crazy, but in mine, you're the one that's nuts because you keep telling me things are happening that don't fit with what I see. I don't know if I want to live in yours. Competing temporalities frame narratives of progress and how it is defined. The path to less violence seems unambiguously to be something that people can agree on is a sign of progress, but people even disagree on the nature of violence and how victimization is categorized. Perhaps nothing illustrates this more than the issue of abortion rights. 2019 was the worst year in terms of how many state legislatures attempted to ban abortion since Roe v. Wade, and 2020 was a year that many people thought would end Roe. A Vice article declared just last week that this year is the worst year for abortion access in a decade. Of course, for anti-abortion activists, this legislation would be seen as progress. Reproductive justice advocates and anti-abortion advocates exist in competing rights temporalities, divergent ideas of progress and who and what is central in stories told about national or human futurity. That categorization of the worst as relative might seem to simply be trivially true, but I do think it speaks to the atemporal, ahistorical, and fragmented storytelling that we see in social media. Social media is paradoxically a place where nothing is forgotten and everything is. Past affect and injury is a search away, but buried under the deluge of the present unless it serves the present. If the present is always our worst, it promises the idea of a better future, even if the arbitrariness of the calendar year inevitably leads us to be stuck in another nadir when the worst effectively seems to strike again. 2020 may very well mark a break with this practice, as the people who predominantly have been positioned to be cavalier about such pronouncements may have actually experienced the covert rupture as a break.
In other words, while we know many people have been living in precarity and will continue to do so, part of the experience of 2020 was introducing precarity into a larger number of lives. Even that demonstrates deep divergence. And I'm sure many of us will attest and, and say that we have felt that people have been living very different pandemics. But the temporality of the worst designation is merely a symptom of the competing temporalities that we inhabit. Because the phenomenological nature of time results in very different conceptions of how time is experienced and discussions of what time can mean, the variations can result not only in difference, but competing conceptions that cannot exist simultaneously and without conflict. Competing, temporar competing temporalities embedded in narratives of the worst in progress were on full display in the 2016 and 2020 elections. People on the left and right saw the dystopian futures, depending the very different dystopian futures, depending on the outcome. According to some conservatives in the United States, the story of America goes like this. It became great because of traditional family values. The most perfect moment exhibiting these values was in the 1950s. After World War II, when the country experienced unparalleled growth and mom was at home making apple pie, men were men and women were women and everyone had their place ordained by God. My favorite person uh, to point to who tells the story is former Senator and presidential candidate, Pat Buchanan, who spent a lot of time discussing this lost utopia. White men, he eulogizes, used to be role models. In an essay titled, The Great White Hope, he writes that he misses the time when straight white men occupied every position. Our founding fathers, the heroes on TV and in movies, every job, the great capitalist, and they were every president. But then that changed. He writes, the world has been turned upside down for white children. History books are being rewritten. Now children are being taught that America was discovered by genocidal white racists who murdered native peoples of color, enslaved Africans to do labor that they refused to do, then went out and brutalized and colonized indigenous peoples all over the world. He believes white people are often depicted as white trash on TV and film. Affirmative action encompasses everyone but straight white men who are now tragic victims in this multicultural regime. For that reason, he writes, it was no surprise that Donald Trump was seen in 2016 as the great white hope. Buchanan's romanticization of the past easily elides over the legally sanctioned and horribly oppressive circumstances for people of color and queer people in US history, uh, and women and pretty much everyone <laughs> who are not straight white men and who are middle class. And this is arguably similar to the erasing um, of the violence of enlightenment philosophy in producing cruelty in what is allegedly, allegedly the long piece, right? It is unclear to me how Buchanan wants teachers to handle the actual fact that white men murdered native peoples of color, um, enslaved Africans do labor they refused to do, then went out and brutalized and colonized indigenous people all over the world. Should they just ignore it, say it didn't matter, um, not actually treat it as injury? And importantly, in his logic, women, or at least white women, were better off because they stayed at home and their children were better off because they were at home and thus families were better off. As we examine competing temporalities, what quickly becomes apparent is not only time periods are framed atemporally, requiring national forgetting and treating fantasies about future years as inevitable utopias that will be universally transparent and agreed upon. Some bodies are atemporal and outside of time and narratives about the worst and progress. African-Americans' quest for rights and equality are perpetually framed as untimely, an untimeliness that can paradoxically be too soon or too late. Civil rights movement activists were described as moving too fast or advised to go slow. Today, affirmative action interventions in higher education and reparations are described as too late. Martin Luther King Jr.'s timing was framed as inconvenient for not giving new city administrations time to act or constructing well-timed protest. In response to the idea that activists and their acts were untimely, he argued that critics lived by a mythical concept of time. 
the sense that there have been time enough for African-Americans as a group to progress more, or that there should be a significant difference between the past and present is part of what can make African-Americans perpetually outside of time in the nationalist imagination of the US. The tax on voting rights violate the logic of progress, even as it is evidence of progress to others. From the 2013 Shelby County Supreme Court verdict to the present, conservatives make the claim that progress makes it possible to restrict rights. For others, it is transparently a rollback or illustrative that progress has not occurred. Temporal narratives about progress are myths about time and rights embedded in everyday life. Such narratives depend on the inclusion of some representation and the exclusion of others. Hermeneutic practices that treat some moments and events and others as inconsequential in the path toward more equal futures. Recognition of the fact that progress has not occurred equally for everyone is key to disrupting national myths because while they are more likely to be ignored, they are also harder to assimilate into national narratives that make the lack of black success idiosyncratic or willful resistance to the march toward progress. Empirical data may demonstrate the resistance to a US national telos that can accommodate inequities, but impersonal empiricism is diminished among the powerful mythical narratives that anthropomorphize America as a hero in righting the wrongs against black life. The local can disrupt teleology by calling attention to the loose threads it cannot accommodate. Paying attention to specificity and the local calls attention to the untimely. Standing in contrast to a national discourse of formal equality narrated through landmark legal cases and popular narratives, functioning as an aberration and not a sign. When a place disrupts national temporal narratives, it is because an incident becomes an event, rupturing not only how history has been told, but how a futurity founded on progress is imagined. As to how much of a rupture COVID will be remains to be seen. I hope after 2020, framings of the worst year will be put to rest. For the worst is always yet to come. If it's not your worst, it is someone's. And living in and with the Anthropocene guarantees that the worst is yet to come. The planet is warming, fires are raging, the ice caps are melting, and species are dying. Declaring each year is the worst has been a joke, and yet not. Social media narrative practice has constructed years as genre. They are tragedies, melodrama, black comedies, or disaster films. The image of drivers on the 405 in Los Angeles and the nightmarish fires seems to be on the verge of engulfing them, seems straight out of a horror film, depicting the gates of hell opening up, or a Roland Emmerich disaster film. 2020 is the worst is the title of a transmedia story that is a genre mashup. Many narrative and media theorists would contest this claim, how I'm framing it as stories, the putting together Twitter, news articles, blogs, Facebook, and podcasts to see it's constructing some kind of coherent narrative about our year. Um, It is repetitive and not organized, although we know it is highly curated. It functions somewhat as a choose your own adventure with some people on a path to QAnon and others to hopes about an AOC presidential run. If temporality is the sticking point in seeing it as a narrative, that this year has been intensely episodic, filled with cliffhangers and notable events that move the story forward is quite clear. But it's also the resistance to the linear trajectory that we move forward but stay stuck in place that can help us understand the realist mode of 2020 as the worst narrative. The pleasure many generic narratives give us is in promising closure, skipping the mundane, glossing over the unrepresentability of trauma, um, that we are both here and not here in our historical present. We are still seeing there is no closure to 2020, the legacies of it, of the years since the 2016 election, of hundreds of years of history. So an ethical pessimism can orient us to the continual untimeliness of suffering, the ongoing struggle over competing future. Being stuck is not a failure, but a radical orientation to focus on the struggle of people who will not have the luxury of living in our less ruptured presence post COVID and post Trump future. Thank you. Wow, thank you so much, both of you. I 
Um, we planned for you two to speak to one another given the topics that you had proposed, but I'm so pleased and stunned with how many resonances there are across the two presentations that you just gave. So I, I have a lot of thoughts and notes and I'm just gonna draw out a little bit of what I saw as really, um, really beautifully wrought, but also very central to what I see as the Long 2020 project. And so I'm, I wanna thank you, first of all, by saying, by acknowledging how um, you're really doing the deep historical work that we had hoped the Long 2020 project would do, which is to say that each of you in different ways are looking at these, um, the historical narratives that we have in the US about progress, about, um, about nationhood, about rupture and continuity that are really important to think through when we think about why we're experiencing the various crises that we are today. Um, and then the national, and both of you are thinking about national teleologies in a way that I find very, very useful. Um, Roderick, I was so interested in what I think is maybe one of the central tenets of your piece, which is that um, in the US since, I mean, you trace it out perhaps um, drawing from Tissage and something as early as the Vietnam War, but perhaps if we dig deeper, we could think of even earlier um, historical roots, but the idea that we live in a post-truth, we have a post-truth telos in the US by choice. And it's not just the choice of those that are being governed or those that are governing. It's also by um, consent of the people who there's, it's a social formation in which it's mutually advantageous because it allows um, the middle-class white body, national body to, um, to continue to exclude people of color, essentially, that those historical exigencies we don't have to think about because we have agreed to accept a particular version of truth. And I find that to be a very timely observation and also a, a timeless one. Like it's a, it's a central, it's a core tenet of our nation. And I, I'm, so I, I wanna thank you for that. Um, Rebecca, I was really struck by, so I'm gonna move now to maybe see if there's something we can speak across, although your work already does that very well. Um, I, I mean, both of you are talking about temporality and um, I've been really struck, Rebecca, also by the, the media declarations and the social media declarations about this year being the worst. And it's also a peculiar rhetorical turn that I find people seem to give the year agency as though um, it came out of nowhere and it's the years, I mean, I've seen lots of political cartoons and like internet memes that suggest that 2020 is its own agent um, and, has, and has done this to us, the unawares and undeserving you know, subjects of this violence. Um, but you, I think make a really trenchant point, which is that the enlightenment, it's, you know, we think of, when you think about it, first of all, that the, um, we live in like historically speaking, on the long timeline of history, a, a, a peaceful, you know, a long time of peace and that there's less violence now than there were at other moments in human civilization. Um, so that's part of it. But the other part of it is that the enlightenment, which we think of as ushering in this era of peace actually relied foundationally on all these forms of cruelty um, and cruelty specifically applied to um, colonized peoples, peoples of color, et cetera. Um, and so, I want to ask, I think in, in ways that are obvious, each of you are talking about embodiment um, already, but I want to ask each of you to maybe comment on that a little bit further. Um, because Rebecca, you very directly talk about some bodies being outside of time and your quote, Samuel Delaney quote, um, I think speaks to that really nicely. But maybe I'll start with Rod and ask if you have been thinking about embodiment in the way that you're framing post-truth. Um, and if so, how? Yeah, no, thanks for that. Um, you know, I was so happy to um, be paired with, you know, Rebecca and delighted to see the resonances across, um, you know, our presentations. Absolutely. You know, one of the things that really interests me about the post-truth as a discursive formation and also as a subject um, formation is how, you know, it's kind of two pronged. It's, I will be, you know, speaking as a post truth subject, not myself, you know, I can be unencumbered by the other, 
the body of the other, the presence of the other. And I can also be unencumbered by the cultural production about and of the other, you know, too. So those two things are going on at the same time. Um, you know, that, you know, it is about alienating oneself from the people around you, right? It's also alienating yourself from the discourses, uh, the uh, subjugated knowledges, you know, the disinterred histories, you know, the critical production by those people and about those people, you know, too. So that um, the embodiment, um, you know, is always tied to uh, a, an anxiety about an intellectual production. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's always been something that's interested me as a kind of maneuver of whiteness. You know, um, or if we're talking about, um, you know, that aspect of whiteness that's also patriarchal or what have you, you know, it's never simply about the, you know, physicality of the other. It's also about what the other represents and the other's representations. You know? Um. Yeah, I think that, you know, in going back to Rod's comments were so helpful in my sort of going back to this question of the truth and um, bodies that contest the framings of the truth um, and feeling like I have to sort of work that in. You know, so there's the story, if I go back to Buchanan and a whole bunch of people who are like, like there's this general narrative is like, so the US and the West, like they really started to get things right, right? With enlightenment, like the 18th and 19th century, it's like, ah, oh, democracy, like everything, you know, it's like they started like, so it was just the long progress, the long process towards freedom, right? And then in the 60s, basically, you know, people started to mess with it. All these other bodies like started to mess with it. Like, you know, black people were messing with it colonized people and various people were messing with, feminists were messing with it, they were disrupting it. And then all these theoretical formulations that you know we might loosely group under post-structuralism that are influenced by enlightenment philosophy also started, to, and then theorists of race and feminism started to disrupt, queer theorists started to disrupt the framings of truth, right? And so then, then we have like right now in the present, like this narrative where people are saying, see, you all produced Donald Trump and some, I actually just had this argument some couple weeks ago. They were like, you know, you could have seen this happening, right? Because the, you know, all this questioning of truth and what it means has, um, has, has produced the conditions under which we're having a hard time making in case for the empirical. And this retreat and embrace of the empirical and truth and enlightenment is the thing where we can find things. And, um, and I'm thinking where we can really contest oppression, right? As if there aren't these long histories where we have to sort of find ways to show what allegedly um, is truthful or empirical is erasing all kinds of other evidence. And that's why Lord is always so useful in thinking about embodiment. Like what, what is it that you know experience and embodiment can tell us outside of this framework, right? So and thinking about these sort of com competing knowledge production projects as something that we have to sort of constantly reenact at various moments to try to remind people of how to reframe experience in the present in order to imagine something else. When people just often want to recruit, retreat to a sort of romanticized version of when something was gotten right, right? Um, so. That's really interesting. You're making me think about a lot of different things, one of which is like, uh, um, I have white parents <laughs> and I'm trying to think through, you know, their confusion about this summer and their wh white, I mean, neither of you use the phrase white privilege, but so much of what you're describing, people have been encapsulating succinctly as just by talking about white privilege and being surprised that things, um, that there's still a reason to protest, that there, that the gains made in the sixties were a, um, were substantive, first of all, you know, white people of a certain age assume that privilege um, 
equality was reached in the 60s and that there's no more need for protests and people are surprised by things. But what you're saying about empiricism versus like embodied experience, I think it's activists are in a double bind because um, on the one hand, it, there is empirical evidence about all kinds of inequalities, but people and but it's it's all available. Like researchers have been gather, you know, sociologists have been gathering data on these things for decades and decades. And and in some cases, um, you know, federal policy is like designed to produce systemic inequality, right? Like you can think about housing law or any other number of kinds of federal policies and like they're designed to produce these outcomes empirically. Um, but then you, you could point to that, but it's ignored. If you point out um, embodied experience and say, well, person who is not experienced, um, person who has, has experienced white privilege, if you try to point out to them, like my embodied experience of being a citizen in, in the US is very different from yours and they don't wanna hear that either or they don't have a framework for thinking about that. And so I think that's a really difficult position to be in. Um, and it makes me, yeah, I mean, it's difficult to think about. It makes me wonder what it would take for, um, for progress on various fronts to occur. But it also, I'm reminded of the, the telos of, you know, there's no inevitability and there's no, um, there's no constant upward movement that we can expect. I mean, history doesn't just progress in this linear fashion. Um, no. Yeah, Maureen, if I could um, jump in, I wanted to read um, a part that I cut out uh, in the interest of time, but this is a quote from Baldwin that gets at your point exactly. Um, and this is from a 1965 essay that Baldwin wrote called White Man's Guilt. People who imagine that history flatters them as it does indeed since they wrote it are impelled on their history like a butterfly on a pen and become incapable of seeing or changing themselves or this world. This is the place in which it seems to me most white Americans find themselves impaled. They are dimly or vividly aware that the history they have fed themselves is mainly a lie, but they do not know how to release themselves from it. And they suffer enormously from the resulting personal incoherence. So there you have, um, not whiteness as a reaction to um, the critiques of the post-truth, but whiteness as um, a reaction to its own invention, you know? <laughs> that, um, you know, the sort of fits of anxiety, the sort of uh, neuroses, the resentment, the psychoses uh, are on, you know, perhaps a kind of unconscious level, a realization that it's all a lie. And what do you do? You know, you could go the way of a Pat Buchanan, or you can go the way of um, those folks who have honestly tried to confront and undo their own whiteness as white people. And I think, you know, this question of, you know, what, balancing out like that progress was made like we should um we you know we acknowledge like the work you know of the ancestors right the work that people have done um to sort of create better conditions like while there are people who are sort of living in spaces where they're seeing less resonance of, of, of sort of transformation um which I thought a lot, of, I mean, a lot, some of this comes from a paper about Ferguson and sort of the space times of Ferguson since I live in St. Louis and the, the ways in which there were like people who in, you know, following the, the decline of St. Louis as a city, what's happened structurally, economically in the space and living in the county and how the police treats them like it's, um, they, a lot of people were not seeing some of the successes that other people had seen, right? So, I mean, thinking about like people living in different space times, like in a city, like just like a lot of neighborhoods, um, Midwestern neighborhoods, you go one street and it's, mm -hmm. there can be affluence, you go another street, there's someplace else, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, one thing I was really struck by when things were happening here initially with Ferguson, and, and I would, you know, talk to some white people were said like, well, no, Saint, the sign of St. Louis and how backwards it is, it's like, you know, you have one street where there's like all this affluence and like you have this other street where there's all this poverty as if the things being next to each other was the sign. And I said, so 
and you know, I'm not disputing the fact that that St. Louis is a troubled city with troubled histories, but I just like I still haven't lived in the city where I'm not experiencing like it's expe- uh, uh, you know excessive signs of anti-black racism. So people point me to places they lived in the West where I know that the lack of black people was produced by sundown towns and like all kinds of things, or you know there were places they liked Atlanta where like they're you're pushing poverty out, so it was like far away from you. It's like the proximity is not the thing that is producing the signification of, of, of excess, right? Like that this is the place where it is the most severe, right? So, but there's something about how people want to conceptualize spatially um, racial progress and not just temporally, which is really interesting to me. Um, so I just, you know, I'm just always sort of trying to work through like how you, sort of make real for people in ways where they're not just trying to displace um, quality to some other um, kind of framework. Like it was like some urban history uh, failure specifically that, you know, created an anomaly as as opposed to something that's systemic. Um, Or, you know, laws passed. So clearly if de facto desegregation is gone, then obviously things are, or better. I mean, I, I run into this with, um, I always tell the story to my students and trying to talk about, um, you know, how you can still say that there's inequality despite the fact that there are um, laws against it. I talk about the housing all the time. And when I sold my house, how I whitened my house and how I, you know, I removed like the black pictures and I borrowed like some really like Nordic looking pictures from white lesbian friends. And I had like a white friend like to do their appraisal. And, um, and, you know, because there's all this evidence that, um, you know, black people's houses are um, often appraised to less value. And I was like, it was a really tight sort of money situation when I was selling my first house. And I, and one of my friends whose house had been devalued by like $80,000 because of this, like said, like, okay, you need to do this. And when I talked about this on in, in social media, on Facebook, there was like a childhood white friend who was just like, that's disgusting. You don't need to do what's illegal. And, and, you know, it was like, they just didn't believe it. And then there was story after story that people were telling about how they'd experienced this or people they know had experienced what happened, happened in neighborhoods, right? Like, it's just like, so here's embodied evidence, right? But still, no, it can't be the case, right? Yeah, yeah, and yeah. that's, you know, and that's, that's what you're constantly struggling with. It's like, no, no, we fixed this. But mm-hmm. here's this like embodied evidence that just can't be legible or just totally just uh, challenges people's understanding how to be. Yeah. Able to no, and I, you know, it's, I appreciate that story because, you know, it's in that moment where innocence becomes a kind of racial category mm-hmm. and it also becomes really dangerous and cancerous, you mm-hmm. know? Like, <laughs> mm-hmm. I will not confront overwhelming evidence of the contrary and of these contradictions. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I, gosh, that is a, that's an alarming story, but I believe it. And I also, I'm interested in just cause my own work is on lifestyle media and real estate and um, those sorts of things. So that's astonishing, but it also makes me think a lot about, um, well, someone I, I cite a lot and read. Um, so I apologize if this is like, how does your work relate to my work? Um, but it, it did make me think of Lauren Berlant because um, so much of what you're describing in that anecdote, and also just more broadly, I guess, Rebecca, what you're describing about people who are so surprised by this year and being like, well, this is the, what? Like, we don't deserve this. All, so much of that depends on like the positionality of the journalists and the people who have voices um, to make such claims that 2020 was the worst year on record or whatever. And it makes me think about like, a particular kind of investment in um, the good life, a belief in like what your life should look like now in 2020, that we have, again, that we've solved various problems and um, that there should be no problems of this kind of catastrophic and deeply seated nature anymore. Um, But of course, the belief in the American dream in that way, the particular way that Lauren Berlant describes, it's like, it was only ever available to you, but it's, it, you know, you continue to cling to it in ways that seem increasingly less tenable. Um, and it seems to me that some of what you're describing with the, the um, lamentations around the worst, it seems to be part of that. And I also thought of affective because you were talking a little bit about stuckness 
So I wondered if you had thoughts about that. Well, I mean, yeah, I mean, to make transparent, I mean, you all invited me to participate in this after a, um, a conversation I had um, in celebration at U of Toronto of, of Lauren's um, work, right? Um, so it was about sort of responding to um, her work on precarity um, and thinking about, um, you know, how my work resonated with hers. And, and so certainly, I mean, a lot of my work um, has been built on sort of, um, or deeply influenced by her framings of sentimentality and national um, fictions about um, innocence and race and identity, right? And that um, that this this idea of precarity and who's experiencing it in the present, like who was experiencing the 2020, for who did we see like then had like greater precarity? I mean, I mean, part of you know what's interesting in in thinking about 2020 are these things that sort of happened that people like intuited would happen, like so you know, the unhoused and the, you know, people who were vulnerable already like became more vulnerable. There were some people who were not vulnerable that suddenly did become vulnerable. Um, and then there were some people who were just quite fine, like people who could, in some ways, right, who could work at home, um, car sales and, you know, went up, you know, they were fine. Housing has been strong, right? Like, so there are all these things that, that, again, are showing like these just completely different pandemics that people were living in. So as opposed to sort of constructing a narrative where it's like a general universal experience where everyone says that, well, you know, there are lots of things that, you know, we miss and that were horrible and were bad, but there were some people who really demonstrably had um, worse outcomes that were, you know, made worse because of their already existing vulnerabilities. And some people, you know, weren't suffering economically, right? And so it's it's like thinking about um, the way we frame precarity in relationship to um, neoliberal, neoliberalism and, and the present, I think it really matters because we have to recognize sort of variations shaped by identity that, um, that are producing these sort of national discourses and what kinds of erasures we perform when we are engaging in them. I want to ask something that's a little bit tepid and silly, <laughs> maybe, but um, there's been a lot of talk from people who have recognized this as a, as a year of trauma, that, that things can't return to normal. There's a lot of now discourses about like um, disavowing the past, that there will now be a change. There's already been internal changes welling up inside people in their kind of habits and daily lives. And that also on a political register, on the broad political scale, there's been, um, you know, Biden's whole campaign was about building back better. And indeed, some of the stuff that he, some very surprising policies have already been put into play. I'm thinking in particular about the like child, the basically like um, guaranteed income that was built into this most recent bill that passed. Um, for um, that will lift half of American children out of poverty. I mean, that's a really surprising mm -hmm. um, move, and I and not to trust it completely and say that no, nothing will go back to the way it was. But I, I just wonder what you make of um, those discourses that things will be radically different now that this was some kind of rupture that has allowed people to see things in a new way. Um, is that another? Is that a mutation of the post truth? Mm -hmm. I, mean, I think that um, you know there are some things that will change for the better. There are some things that will stay the same. There are some things that will get worse. <laughs> but we don't need to respond to you know this moment um, thinking that it's going to usher in some sort of Eden. I mean, it's very clear that um, you know that our institutions have failed. Um, that uh, we, you know, institutions have been very slow, especially academic ones have been very slow to, uh, you know, actually radically change, you know, their practices around grading, around um, recognizing student, mental health, um, around faculty, 
mental health and well being, right? Um, that Zoom has also ushered in a moment in which we are busier than ever because we don't have to leave our homes. And so the usual uh, obstacles aren't there, you know, the spatial ones. So we can crowd our days with more and more Zoom meetings, you know? And like all of these are signs of a dysfunction, a growing dysfunction. They're not signs that things are actually progressing towards, um, you know, the better stuff. At the same time, uh, you know, the pandemic has allowed us to see that the things that we thought we could not do, they actually can be done, you know? Um, that you can repurpose institutions, you know, overnight to, um, you can turn a school cafeteria, if there's a will, you know, to a place that will feed a neighborhood and not just the kids in it, you know? Um, so, but all that to say is that in the same way that you think of uh, Rebecca's uh, argument, where she's rightly uh, calling us to be critical of any assumptions of a progress narrative, um, we can apply that to how we think about this pandemic and life after it. Rebecca, did you want to add anything to that? I mean, I think that I, um, like I said, I just, I really struggle. Um, I think that part of what I'm sort of interested in is, is like how, how are we sort of also reframing or framing in rhetorical context and what spaces do we use to do it? I mean, I think, and, and like, and who's the we? Like scholars, scholars who are also producing on media, we're producing academic work, et cetera. Um, um, or just the general public, like how do we, you know, produce narratives to to have people think differently about progress and um, rights over the course of time? And you know, I've been struck by this in thinking about critical race theory and how this sort of discourse is, you know, the circulating about critical race theory is this boogeyman that's like coming to destroy America or. Um, in, in France, like this sort of preposterous idea that the US brought all these like ridiculous ideas about race and feminism as if some of their, the most important um, race theorists and feminist theorists didn't actually come from France or places that France colonized, right? Like, you know, it's this like this idea that we're, um, that that we've lost, we, like we, we just haven't been able to construct narratives that then we also are able to put into broader circulation to win a rhetorical battle um, about ideas, so about these ideas. And I'm, I'm so, I guess, um, and I think precarity, precarity in relationship to COVID is one of the things I'm thinking about in relationship to this and how like some things are better and some things are worse. Like it's, it's just so, it's so antithetical to, um, the kinds of stories the U.S. perpetuates about itself, you know, like, and then people who like are in, like the investment that people buy into about like the U.S. and progress, um, even people who should know better. It's hard to imagine how we disrupt it. Yeah, that that makes a lot of sense. I think it's just we just personally, it's frustrating to think about. On the one hand, there are these opportunities. And there's, there is real change happening in certain registers. And then on the other hand, that's going to cause an a retrenchment. Um, people who have, you know, bought into these other alternative, alternative truths, I guess, about the American, uh, the America that they're comfortable with. And those are going to continue to be in opposition to another. Um, I'm also thinking, I, it just something that occurred to me when Rod was speaking earlier about um, some things being better, some things being worse, but, um, we didn't talk too much yet about the role of artists and activists. And I wonder if you, um, that's something you brought up that had been an important factor in the eighties um, and these earlier periods when the kind of post-truth moment was in formation. And I wonder if you see any work at, in those areas now that is um, 
giving you hope or um, something new to think about. I mean, absolutely. I think that, um, I mean, all of us witnessed um, the summer of uh, 2020 and the kinds of uh, shifts that, that, that those protests wrought, right? That, um, you know, the number of people who are now using the word defunding, you know, in relation to the police, that would not have happened if there were those protests, you know? And the number of people who have started to think seriously about the different ways in which um, different communities uh, and peoples respond to policing and are regarded by the police, that happened because of those social movements, right? You know, so to the extent that there has been you know, um, a kind of uh, compulsion to confront the ugliness of history, you know, not just the past history, but our ongoing history, you know, it's been in art and in activism, you know? And those of us who do it in the academy, you know, we do so because of the conditions that artists and activists um, have produced, you know? So, I mean, this is a pitch that there must always be art, there must always be activism, and we must do everything we can to protect those things. And it's, yes, and that's true. That's a good reminder in terms of, and a corrective to what I just said, I think too, in terms of thinking about how um, the spaces that matter in terms of really sort of transforming sort of everyday thinking. I mean, how many years were scholars, activists too, scholars talking about defunding the police or other kinds of arguments and that, um, you know, we see in our students, you know, who will go out and who are already doing brilliant things, but will go out and do more brilliant things. And we see like in the conversations that we have with artists and artist spaces and museums and, um, like we see these reverberations of critical discussions, right? Like to, to understand you know, that we're, we're all part of um, an ecosystem of ideas where like, even though we can be frustrated by seeming, when it seems like um, there's one strand of rhetoric that seems to be controlled by sort of, um, sort of a media establishment that is, you know, deeply conservative and not concerned with nuance or complexity, that there's always these pushbacks, right? It's, you know, power is never complete, right? So um, that's, it's it's a good reminder in our in in them um, in the nadirs. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. I wonder. Um, I'm a little surprised we don't have any questions. It must mean that you've laid everything out so beautifully and clearly that there is nothing left to probe. But I, um, if anybody has questions, feel free to post them in there. But I just might ask as a last um, a last thing I'll say is what I wonder if either of you have questions for each other. I know you are familiar with one another's work and our colleagues, so maybe you have those chats elsewhere offline. Well, I, you know, I'll go back to the um, really intriguing passage, Rebecca, that you read from um, Dahlgren, where the character says, I don't know if I want to live in yours, your city, right? So I wonder if you, you know, have any thoughts about the role of speculative fiction, you know, here, you know, and its potential for, or its history of, and its potential for, you know, continuing to critique, you know, the sort of progress narrative and um, uh, who is, for whom is the year the worst? So, in one of the papers that fed into this, I, um, I'm talk I talk about N.K. Jemison's Broken Earth trilogy, which is you know, you know, basically about the Anthropocene, and uh, and there's an end. It's a it's about like the end of the world and sort of beginnings. And 
um, you know, thinking about how um, speculative fiction writers, um, particularly some of the ones I know best, like Butler um, and um, Delaney, et cetera, I mean, people, people who work on race and gender and sexuality, um, they help us really imagine other worlds and that, that that kind of conceptualization is um, a refusal of conversations that are just about like what one can't do, right? I mean, that's what that that's what it sort of offers for us is like when we can get bogged down on sort of um, conversations about well, something's impractical that will never happen, or you know, the, like impossibility is like frames so much political discourse. Um, and an activist discourse too, and sort of competing ideas about like what will actually work, right? And so I try to remind myself as someone who can be like deeply fatalistic, particularly now that I've started doing administration, I'm just like, oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that I resonate it's with. All, yeah. you know, no, I know exactly what you're talking about. Yes, <laughs> like I have no hope, but like I, I like to think, you know, that you, I just, you know, you have to keep just imagining elsewhere, particularly with these speculative fictions I'm talking about, they're about dystopias and the apocalypse and like deep, like really depressing spaces where people still imagine something else, right? And so that I think that that um, helps us, you know, activate our critical imagination. So, but on that front, I guess I'm, I'm curious, like given your work on higher education and thinking about higher education and post-truth discord, like how, how this conversation and this work works in relationship to some of your higher ed um, mm -hmm. discussions. Like, how do we, how do we sort of put those things in conversations with each other? Particularly, we didn't talk about 2020 in higher ed, but there are, there's a whole other version of, of these of these conversations could be about that. So I'm just curious how you might put those things together. Yeah, I mean, I think that. Uh, thank you for that. I think that um, you know, I go back to that part that I read where Tessich says, the reason our kids fail in school is because we want them to fail <laughs> in school. <laughs> you know, and so for me, that's a very clarifying observation, right? In terms of if we are to have a kind of alternative vision of the school and of education, whether we're talking about K through 12, whether we're talking about higher ed, you know, we have to make the classroom into that space that, you know, educates in the best sense that, you know, it is, you know, like the encounter with art in that moment where even if you don't like this painting, even if it unnerves you, stand in front of it. You know, you know, let it do, let the conversation happen. Even if it's unpleasant, you know, trust in the process that there's a benefit in that unpleasantness that, you know, you will not die from it. Uh, if you allow yourself this engagement, you too will know personal transformation, you know? And I think that you know, we have to sort of hold on to that vision, you know, of the classroom. And for me, that is what is at stake in the work that I do, you know, around um, critical um, university studies. And also, you know, that the simple observation, we need social movements. We need student movements, you know? Um, power concedes nothing without a demand. That is doubly the case for our institutions. You know, if there is going to be innovation, it is because there is mobilization. You know, um, so there is nothing trivial about student organizing. Nothing trivial about it. Yeah, I really like that. Thanks. Mm -hmm. I want to throw in one last comment from Erica Richardson that was just sent to the panelists, but I want everyone to hear it. Brilliant work from both panelists thinking about the ways contestations of oppression are obscured and rethought and how continuous this process is. So 
I suppose if we all feel good, we can leave it there. Thank you so much. This was a fantastic conversation. I really appreciate hearing from both of you. Yeah, well, thank you, um, Maureen and Richard and Rebecca. It's been wonderful to be in conversation with you. Same, good to see you. Thanks you so too. much. All right, take care everybody. Bye.